Good afternoon and welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical. I hope the week has gone well. Uh, let me start with macro thoughts. Bloomberg growth tracker for China fell below 6% in August. That's David Inglis. There's a lot of skepticism around this number. Folks like Kyle Bass in particular reckon it's uh, about half the number that's been declared. I tend to err on that side as well. However, I refer you to this point I made in May. Um, I was quoting a Chinese professor who said, if there is a decoupling between the two economies, so be it. The Chinese people can endure more pain than the spoiled and hubristic Americans. And I think that remains a key point as to the pain threshold uh, that can be endured in this trade war. Home thoughts, Patrick Rooney from Chicago, Sunrise on Madison in Chicago, wonderful city. Um, I really like it, particularly in the autumn or in the spring. Um, there's some footage that we took of uh, Sunrise with a herd of elephants when we visited Finch Hattons. If you haven't seen that, um, I do encourage you to watch it. It's really quite beautiful. Um, this is sunrise tinting the clouds at Mount Kenya when we were staying at the Mount Kenya Safari Club. And of course it was William Holden who was the best man at Ronald Reagan's wedding to Nancy Davis who founded the Mount Kenya Safari Club in Nanuki in 1959. If you want peace and security for your facilities and towers made of glass that cannot withstand one drone, then leave Yemen alone, said the Houthi army spokesperson. And it was this comment by the spokesman which took me down a wormhole and essentially took me firstly um, to uh, uh, the Dubai Burj Khalifa, which I think was one of the buildings he was referring to, and I, for one, would be disinclined to buy an apartment there right now. You live in a tower that soars to heaven and goes unpunished by God, Don DeLillo Cosmopolis, and that took me to The Spire, which was a book I studied at A-level, which made a very big impression on me, William Golding, 1964 novel, uh, described as a dark and powerful portrait of one man's will. It deals with the construction of the 404-foot high spire, loosely based on Salisbury Cathedral, the vision of the fictional Dean Jocelyn. In this novel, Golding utilizes stream of consciousness, writing with an omniscient but increasingly fallible narrator. Jocelyn may have been named after Jocelyn de Bohan, the Bishop of Salisbury from 1142 to 1184, who is buried in the Salisbury Cathedral. I came across an article about the spire in The Guardian, <clears throat> published in 1964. The dean of a cathedral, Jocelyn, wants to add a spire to the building, which has no foundations and is therefore a kind of miracle already. The novel is about the second highly imperfect miracle, the erection of the spire and the cost which is physical, financial and spiritual. Here is Golding's creation of not one pillar but several. Everywhere fine dust gave these rods and trunks of light the importance of a dimension. He blinked at them again, seeing near at hand how individual grains of dust turned over each other or bounced all together like mayfly in a breath of wind. He saw how further away they drifted cloudily coiled or hung in a moment of pause, becoming in the most distant rods and trunks nothing but colour, 
honey colour slashed across the body of the cathedral. He shook his head in rueful wonder at the solid sunlight. Golden can scorch us by the immediate heat of his sentences, but sometimes he chooses the slower narrative burn. The first chapter begins with Jocelyn holding the model of the spire and laughing. He was laughing chin up and shaking his head. God the Father was exploding in his face with a glory of sunlight through painted glass, a glory that moved with his movements to consume and exalt Abraham and Isaac and then God again, the tears of laughter in his eyes made additional spokes and wheels and rainbows, chin up, hands holding the model spire before him, eyes half closed, joy, I waited half my life for this day. God the Father was exploding in his face, which is initially as enigmatic as it is dramatic, until it is resolved as a metaphorical description of sunlight streaming through a stained glass window. The delay is important. There is a semantic lag, a slight postponed understanding throughout the spire. Rushing on with the angels, the infinite speed that is stillness, hair blown, torn back, straightened with the wind of the spirit, mouth open, not for uttering rainwater, but hosannas and hallelujahs. And then the function of the gargoyle is overridden by Jocelyn primarily, though he is conscious of his hubris, a hubris he attributes to the sculptor. Don't you think you might strain my humility by making an angel of me? And what is the answer to this question? The sculptor shakes his head, humming in the throat, head shake, dog-like, eager eyes. Is the dumb sculptor denying that Jocelyn's humility is vulnerable? Or is he denying that he ever thought of portraying Jocelyn as an angel in the first place? Jocelyn's extrapolation is, after all, based on a gesture. In Golding's novel, comedy means something dark and bitterly ironic. Is Jocelyn's angel an angel, or is the angel a hallucination caused by Jocelyn's tuberculous spine? There are two explanations. It is not until the final pages that we know for a certainty that we can never know. This is a view across Harnham Water Meadows to Salisbury Cathedral. The photograph is by Peter Lewis of Loop Images. And of course, it was the anniversary of 9-11, just a few days ago, about which I've already spoken. And uh, that took me to Thomas Pynchon, Bleeding Edge. Twin Buddhas, Twin Towers, interesting coincidence. So what? You remember those twin statues of the Buddha that I told you about carved out of a mountain in Afghanistan that got dynamited by the Taliban back in the spring? Notice anything familiar? Twin Buddhas, twin towers. Interesting coincidence. So what? The Trade Center Towers were religious too. They stood for what this country worships above everything else, the market, always the holy effing market. A religious beef, you're saying? It's not a religion. These are people who believe the invisible hand of the market runs everything. They fight holy wars against competing religions like Marxism against all evidence that the world is finite, this blind faith that resources will never run out, profits will go on increasing forever, just like the world's population, more cheap labour, more addicted consumers. <coughs> this is a photograph of the Twin Towers via the civil engineer. 
The Buddhas of Bamiyan were two sixth-century monumental statues of Gautama Buddha carved into the side of a cliff in the Bamiyan Valley in the Hazarajak region of central Afghanistan. The statues were dynamited and destroyed in March 2001 by the Taliban on orders from their leader Mullah Muhammad Omar after the Taliban government declared that they were idols. Political reflections, Justin Trudeau and this whole blackface issue. And I thought to myself, is it a racist issue or an Aladdin complex? And I was thinking maybe, you know, he had this very famous father, Pierre Trudeau, very beautiful mother, Margaret Trudeau. They travel the world and I somehow imagine that Margaret used to have him play Aladdin when she used to come home after traveling the world. And this is a spillover of that, but that's pure speculation. Secretary Pompeo on his flight back to DC from Abu Dhabi makes clear a military response to Saturday's Aramco attacks is off the table for now. This is via Julian Borgia. I was here in an act of diplomacy. We're here to build out a coalition aimed at achieving peace and a peaceful resolution to this, he said. We'd like a peaceful resolution indeed. I think we've demonstrated that. I was here in an act of diplomacy, Secretary Pompeo continued. We're here to build out a coalition aimed at achieving peace and peaceful resolution to this. That's my mission set. What President Trump certainly wants me to work to achieve, and I hope that the Islamic Republic of Iran sees it the same way. Secretary Pompeo's whiplash from an act of war to flowers for Javad Zarif, what gives? Now, Pepe Escobar has written about this, headlined Houthi rebels overturned the Middle East geopolitical chessboard. We are the Houthis and we're coming to town with the spectacular attack on Abqaiq. Yemen's Houthis have overturned the geopolitical chessboard in Southwest Asia, going as far as introducing a whole new dimension the distinct possibility of investing in a push to drive the House of Saud out of power. Blowback is a bitch. Still, it's always important to consider that Arab Shiites in the Eastern Province, something I wrote about in my article, working in Saudi oil installations have got to be the natural allies of the Houthis fighting against Riyadh. It's not by accident that the UAE saw which way the geopolitical and geo-economic winds were blowing. Abu Dhabi withdrew from Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman's vicious war against Yemen and now is engaged in what is described as a peace-first strategy he bailed out, as I've already told you. The situation has now reached a point where there's plenty of chatter across the Persian Gulf about a spectacular scenario of the Houthis investing in a mad dash across the Arabian desert to capture Mecca and Medina in conjunction with a mass Shiite uprising in the eastern oil belt. That's not far-fetched anymore. I wrote about that as well. The US intel refrain that the Houthis are incapable of such a sophisticated attack betrays the worst strands of Orientalism, Edward Said, and white man's burden superiority complex. The Quds system proved its great ability to hit its targets and to bypass enemy interceptor systems. This operation is one of the largest operations carried out by our forces in the depth of Saudi Arabia and came after an accurate intelligence operation and advanced monitoring and cooperation of honorable and free men within the kingdom. Notice the key concept, cooperation 
from inside Saudi Arabia, <coughs> which could include the whole spectrum from Yemenis to that eastern province Shiites. UN officials openly admit now that everything that matters is within the 1500 kilometer range of the Houthis' new UAB extra and oil fields in Saudi Arabia, a still under construction nuclear power plant in the Emirates, and Dubai's mega airport. US intel insists that 17 drones and cruise missiles were launched in combination from southern Iran. So far, absolutely no record of this trajectory has been revealed. What's important, once again, is that the Houthis do have advanced offensive missiles, and their pinpoint accuracy at Abqaiq was uncanny. For now, it appears that the winner of the US-UK-supported House of One Saudi War on the civilian Yemeni population, which started in March 2015 and generated a humanitarian crisis the UN regards as having been of biblical proportions, is certainly not the Crown Prince. I called it an unwinnable war when he launched it, widely known as MBS. Crude oil stabilization towers, and several of them at Abqaiq, were specifically targeted, along with natural gas storage tanks. Persian Gulf energy sources have been telling me repairs and or rebuilding could last months, even Riyadh admitted as much. There's still a disconnect between the damage that we're seeing. Um, it looks as if, and this is an accusation the Houthis have made as well, that some of the photographs we are being shown might not be reflecting the reality of the attack. Mohammed Morandi from the University of Tehran, who has very close relations with the foreign ministry, says it didn't come from Iran. If it did, it would be very embarrassing for the Americans, showing they were unable to detect a large number of Iranian drones and missiles, that doesn't make sense. A soft and unprotected target, the US PAC-2 and PAC-3 systems in place are all oriented towards the east in the direction of Iran. Neither Washington nor Riyadh knows for sure where the drone swarm missiles really came from. I think they came from within the kingdom, as I said in my article over the weekend. In addition to the US bases in various regions like Afghanistan, Iraq, Kuwait, Emirates and Qatar, we have targeted all naval vessels up to a distance of 2,000 kilometers and we are constantly monitoring them. They think that if they go to a distance of 400 kilometers, they are out of our firing range Wherever they are, it only takes one spark. We hit their vessels, their air bases, and their troops. Of course, the Trump administration knows it, but the fact is they're looking the other way. To state it as concisely as possible, they are caught in a trap by the absolute folly of ditching the JCPOA, and they are looking for a face-saving way out. In the transformation of war, Martin Van Krabelt actually predicted that the whole industrial military security complex would come crumbling down when it was exposed that most of its weapons are useless against fourth generation asymmetrical opponents. Now we're entering a whole new dimension in asymmetric hybrid war. U.S. President Donald Trump gambled big time and he lost. Now he must find a face-saving way out if the war party allows it. And I refer you to my article over the weekend, which was Drone Strike Deep Inside the Kingdom. I started with 9-11 and I said it's increasingly apparent that more Americans are questioning the official 9-11 story as new evidence contradicts the official narrative. Um, and you know, for many years I thought that, but of course, to have popped your head above the parapet, you were automatically called a conspiracy theorist. Um, I looked at JFK, studied that, and of course that too is patently not how it's been officially described. It was something else. 
And uh, that's why, you know, Don de Lillo in his book Libra made such an impression on me. There is a world inside the world. There's always more to it. This is what history consists of. It is the sum total of the things they are telling us. Thomas Pynchon in Bleeding Edge about 9-11, no matter how the official narrative of this turns out, it seemed to Heidi, these are the places we should be looking, not in newspapers or television, but at the margins, graffiti, uncontrolled utterances, bad dreamers, and I suspect the Crown Prince is a bad dreamer, who sleep in public, he doesn't, he sleeps on his boat, and scream in their sleep. And then I was saying that, you know, the swarm of ten armed explosive drones, um, uh, I'm not convinced they can restore the facility as quickly as they're saying that they can. And uh, I was saying, if the Houthis did it, launch the attack from the Yemen, it speaks to the fact that nowhere in the kingdom is safe and that the Houthis have achieved an asymmetric balance. Um, I also re referenced 2017 when I said it was an unwinnable war in the Yemen, it will be a cakewalk, MBS said. Over in a week, he said, they will be throwing rose petals at our feet, he said, none of which has turned out. Um, and then referencing John Kemp. But then I was also saying, could be signaling that the Houthis might well have teamed up with the Saudi Shia, who represent up to 25% of the population and have been ground down viciously by the House of Saud, characterized as apostates. His leaders have been beheaded and crucified. And this is something that obviously Pepe is uh, picking up on. Um, the IPO, I was saying dead in the water, but I saw a report now that they're strong arming rich Saudis to buy the IPO, which is what you'd expect. Um, but I was concluding by asking the overwhelming geopolitical question is around the longevity of the House of Saud and its crown prince, who is of course the proud owner of Leonardo da Vinci's Salvatore Mundi, which means saviour of the world and according to Robert Bayer, has so many enemies he sleeps on his $500 million yacht, the Serene of Jeddah. And I said, the much commented on orb is of no help now, and that if the Houthis have tapped into the Saudi Shia, the House of Saud, in my opinion, is on its last legs. And I said, this is a big call and needs to be understood for that. And no amount of paid PR or kind words from Trump can finesse this. And that's why I'm bullish. Look out. Near term, they're going to damp it down. They're going to talk and the market will react to the near term news. But in the medium term, <clears throat> the entire oil production of 18 million barrels in that region is now under threat, as is the House of Saud. And I think you go one touch. In May, when I was writing about Iran, I quoted Hunter S. Thompson, who described the edge. There is no honest way to explain it, because the only people who really know where it is are the ones who have gone over, and those are the Iranians. But I concluded my mistake was to think that Iran was at the Thompsonian edge, whereas it is clear now that it is also the kingdom. Have a listen to this uh, speech by Sheikh Nima al Nima, who was beheaded or crucified. It's got a translation, it's very powerful. If you really want to understand the Saudi Shia conundrum and problem. 13th of May, I said, if the US thinks that Tehran will just roll over, which appears to be the case, then they're exhibiting the same deluded ideas that they exhibited a day before the peacock throne got plucked. 17th of June, the overwhelming confidence that Iran is displaying both in rhetoric and action is out, out, out astounding. That was Stratfor. This level of Financial and coercive sanction warfare is simply unprecedented. And then Javier Glass tweeted, you know, that Sun Tzu quote, always give, a, give your enemy an exit. And this is the problem, that Iran has no exit anymore. And that's why they've upped the ante. 
UAE's MBZ bailed out of MBS's Yemen war. I wrote about that in July. Um, 13th of November 2017, I said MBS arrived on the scene and immediately launched an unwinnable war in Yemen, and that in all the history books I've read, it's probably wisest to operate on one front, not two, and certainly not three. So, looking at debt 2020, calls, one touch, that's where I'm focusing on. This is the most extraordinary part of Steve Barclay's speech. He's saying that the backstop should be resolved after the UK has left the EU and no legal solution is needed before October the 31st. If this is now government policy, then we're definitely heading for no deal. But the, the uh, sterling has rallied to a two-month high. We're last at 125.61. Um, uh, trading having got up to about 125.80 plus and uh, obviously all the shorts are now being cleaned up as this market tends to do when it feels the won't to do so. Um, but the point is more than that it was uh, Juncker's uh, comments to Sky News which, which triggered this fresh rally but I think we're here, we're now running out of steam and we're going to start turning lower. I take you back to the 5th of August when I wrote this article, What's Your Road Man, Holy Boy Road, Madman Road, Rainbow Road, Guppy Road, Any Road, It's an Anywhere Road for Anybody, Anyhow, Where, Body, How. And I said the key question is this, can 10 Downing Street Boris Johnson self-eject Britain, can he be stopped? This is a political calculation and in my view he can't be stopped. And certainly the Supreme Court is not going to upend hundreds of years of constitutional law and interfere in this matter. The pound jumped as EU's Juncker says the Brexit deal is possible by October the 31st. We're currently at 125.62, but I think now that they've cleaned out all the shorts, we're going to start drifting lower currency markets. Let's turn to that. Euro doing a lot of work around this 110.60 level. I think it turns lower. I think 110.70.75 is resisting the rebound. Dollar index 98.212. Japanese yen 107.82. I think that has softened way too far. Swiss franc 0.9911 didn't reduce rates yesterday, rallied. Um, the pound 125.62, the Australian dollar 0.6803, India rupee 70.8633, taking some respite from the lower oil price after that spike higher. South Korean 111.8889, Brazilian real, that's moved much lower, 416.82. Egyptian pound, firm as you like, 16.3095, and the rand is at 14.7591. This is a dollar index chart. I think you know, we've been drifting off, we're coming back towards 98, but make no mistake, we remain in a bull trend. Euro dollar, this is a three month chart, 110.60. I think we're going to be low 110 sometime next week. Fantastic article about Netflix in the Financial Times. The July 4th arrival of the third series of Stranger Things was the biggest content drop of 2019 for Netflix. If any one piece of content would make a difference on subscriber editions, that should be the one. He was right. Global subscriber numbers spiked in the first two weeks of July. Unfortunately for Netflix, it was two weeks too late. I'm a big buyer of Netflix on this retracement. The market wiped $17 billion of Netflix's stock value overnight, emphasizing the brutal correction between new subscribers and stock market value. The company was predicting seven, is predicting 7 million new subscribers in the third quarter. Everyone focused on the US where it lost subscribers, but it's not a US story anymore. It's a global story. Netflix spearheaded a streaming revolution that changed the way we watch TV and films. Cable TV lost subscribers, Netflix gained them, putting it in a category with Facebook, Amazon and Google as one of the adored US tech stocks that led a historic bull market. 
company spends more than 70% of revenues on content. Analysts estimate that would give it a budget of more than $15 billion this year, more than any other media company. Yet Netflix projects it will spend $3.5 billion more than it will generate in cash in 2019, while promising that this mismatch will narrow over time. Netflix has taken on the vast majority of its $12 billion in long-term debt in the past three years, as it almost doubled its global subscriber base to $150 million. I'm looking for a billion, so that's why I think it's a huge growth story. In an environment of historic low interest rates, investors searching for yield have happily gobbled up Netflix bonds. People wondered why they were paying so much, but in hindsight it now looked smart, says a senior film and television banker. They were building a following ahead of an arms race. Today Netflix faces an onslaught of competition in the market it invented. After years of false starts, Apple is planning to launch a streaming service. They announced it. I think they're going to buy Netflix once uh, Tim Cook wakes up and smells the coffee. Disney with AT&T's Warner Media and Comcast NBC Universal to follow early next year. Um, they all have extensive back catalogs, but it's not about your back catalog, right? It's about fresh content. After raising prices in the US earlier this year, a standard Netflix subscription now costs $30, $13 a month, Apple $5 a month, Disney $7 a month. So I think there's room here and this is what's being underestimated by the market for people to have one or two subscriptions, right? Every quarter felt like a year in which Disney and Fox weren't in the game. The feeling was that we are leap years ahead and it's kind of true. Netflix first invaded US living rooms with its video streaming in 2007, take another six years before it made a big splash with its own shows paid $100 million for two seasons of the political thriller House of Cards, which debuted in 2013 to widespread acclaim. Streaming wars have spawned a phenomenon known as peak TV, with bankers saying there has not been as much capital in Hollywood since the mid-2000s. <clears throat> Even after the loss of subscribers in the second quarter, Ben Swinburne, head of media research at Morgan Stanley, says Netflix is still on course for a record year of subscriber additions. Optimists point to the group's global reach. It is betting its future on expansion outside the US, where it has already attracted 60 million subscribers. Investing heavily in content in places like India and Malaysia, with a focus on local language programming, for now, the stock market appears to be siding with the critics. Netflix's shares have sunk further since its July slide, touching an eight-month low. That values the company at $127 billion. It's a buy, 285, 286. Snaffle it up. Commodity markets, as I said, my weekend piece was about this Saudi oil strike, drone strikes deep inside the kingdom. And WTI currently, where are we? Let's take a look. $58.78. But forget the near term. There's a lot of noise around that. The Saudi's PR machine is going to keep wrestling the price down. Look further out the curve. Because as I said, the game changer is the fact that the House of Saud, which has been there for eons, is now under threat. And this moment is similar to when the peacock throne got toppled. No one saw it coming. They never do. I like the December 2020 area of the uh, crude oil curve. Gold uh, lasts at 15.04 uh, and change. It's not really running away anymore, and it's, but it's not running to the downside, but I still think the trend is now lower. Emerging markets, Brazil's real hit a two-week low. Rate futures plunge after the central bank cut rates and signals more to come. January 2021 rate futures tumbled 25 basis points below 5%. Let's move on to Africa. In 1994, when Nelson Mandela became president, China's per capita GDP was a mere $473. South Africa's was more than seven times higher, 3,445. 
And Howard French is saying China's wager on Africa has paid off stunningly well. Africa's tallest building is set to open next month. The Leonardo is a 234-meter skyscraper within walking distance of the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Interesting article in the Mail and Guardian. A range of African authoritarians live in fear of an Arab Spring occurring south of the Sahara. Facilitated by encrypted social media conversations and nationwide online mobilization, an increase in the number of knee-jerk blackouts does not, however, constitute evidence of authoritarian confidence, quite the reverse. Hence, Israel is going to do a tremendous amount of business in this space. Angola government making reform progress, but still much to do if debt risks to be contained. Some necessary reforms unpopular and risk of pushing too hard is economy recovery fragile. That's Gregory L. B. Smith, Renaissance Capital. Uh, and he's got a little tweet storm that he's done. Very interesting. Need time to shift economy from oil and, and to jobs, but time not on Angola's side. Key areas to watch for investors, FX, balancing budget and stabilizing debt, privatization program, Angola B- rating, negative outlook, they've got a 3.7 billion IMF program, crucial for Eurobond investors and China's exposure, uh, big FX hurdle for non-oil business depreciation since devaluation. Um, official and parallel rate gap narrowed but recently widened. The official rate is now 364. The parallel rate is 535. Until easier FX allocation will be a drag on non-oil investment, creating perverse incentives. Wheeling and dealing replaces entrepreneurship. Um, FX risks also with large public external debt to service. $51 billion, 5 billion euro bonds, 23 billion to China, pressures visible in net FX reserves down to minus 9 billion, down to 9 billion versus mid-29 target of 10 billion. Uh, they got 2 billion cash recovered from the Sovereign Wealth Fund. Uh, they got to balance the budget. Uh, oil will probably help. VAT is being introduced in the 1st of October privatization plan listing 91 companies, um, uh, action needed to stop debt rising far above 90% debt to GDP. That's not good, is it? Yeah, and then he concludes by saying, if visiting, well worth taking a copy of the Brandt Angola guidebook, recommends good places to explore, lots to do in Luanda, particular fondness for central bank museums, seafront running and grilled fresh fish on the beach. The grilled fresh fish on the beach that I like the sound of. And then I re revert back to another Renaissance Capital uh, uh, chief economist, Charlie Robertson, whom I met yesterday and interviewed, and I look forward to publishing that on Monday. This analysis suggests investors should be cautious of Nigeria and Angola, two of the three largest economies in Sub Saharan Africa, which have fertility rates of five or more, according to the UN. For Angola and Nigeria, it will take 20 years before their fertility rates decline to four. So until then, we should not expect a big increase in the share of bank deposits. He's done some excellent research, which um, I'll be sharing with you via the interview. A drought cyclone-induced floods and an economic collapse have left Zimbabwe on the verge of its worst ever famine, Bloomberg. Um, probably run out of corn at staple food by January and about three out of five Zimbabweans won't have enough to eat according to the United Nations World Food Programme. Um, when I went for coffee in Harare this morning the receipt came with an unofficial 18 to 1 Zimbabwe dollar to real dollar exchange rate. It's not even time for sundowners and the latest rates are about 20. It was about 14 to 15 when I got here last week. According to Professor Steve Henke, Zimbabwe's inflation rate by his measure has broken through the 800% a year barrier to a stunning 851% a year. 
And I wrote about this on the 21st of January. I said the point I'm seeking to make is that there is a correlation between high inflation and revolutionary conditions. Zimbabwe is a classic example. 29th of July, Zimbabwe is a laboratory experiment. At that time, inflation was 176%, but then they stopped uh, issuing the number. And I said there is a straw and camel's back moment, but predicting that moment is always a fool's errand. I wrote about the death of Robert Mugabe. I said then most of Zimbabwe's citizens are born free. The fight for independence was real, but is no longer relevant, is it? <clears throat> we are grateful to all those iconic leaders who liberated our continent, of which Mugabe is one, but at what price? Fighting for independence is not the same as building an economy which provides opportunity for all its citizens. Pastor Evan, there can be no mixed feelings, misconceptions or complications about Robert Mugabe's legacy. He presided over the destruction of millions of people's lives over a span of 37 years. Manangagwa, who was eulogizing Mugabe as a revolutionary icon, has failed and is frankly as untenable as his erstwhile mentor. <clears throat> Mugabe's second wife, Gucci Grace, who actually should have been called Ferragama Grace because she said her narrow feet meant she could only wear Ferragama shoes. And this is a photograph of her uh, by Nomsa Maseko, no, by Sifiwe Sebeko. And take you back to Yuval Nair about money inflation. Money is the most universal and most efficient system of mutual trust ever devised. Calorie shells and dollars have value only in our common imagination. Their worth is not inherent in the chemical structure of the shells and paper or their color or their shape. In other words, money isn't a material reality, it is a psychological construct. It works by converting matter into mind. And what I was saying is the mind game that Zanu PF has played on its citizens has evaporated now in a puff of smoke, as you can see by those inflation rates I've just been quoting. But I take you back to Kapuscinski. The choice of that moment is the greatest riddle of history. If the crowd disperses, goes home, does not reassemble, we say the revolution is over. What is clear to me is we're at a tipping point moment now. We're in the end game as far as I can see. And then on 25th of February, I was talking about the overhaul of the dysfunctional whack and even voodoo FX regime. At that time, Tendai Bitti was predicting a 6 to 8 range. Look where we are now. Uh, it's voodoo economics as far as I can see. South African oil shares up 6.42% year to date. Japanese investors, many of whom love the emerging market carry trade, buy and sell a massive $4 billion worth of Iran every single day. That's according to a report via the BIS, via Paul Bollis. Dollar Rand, 14.765. In this range, 14.50, 15.50. Egyptian pound, 16.3095. Uh, and I give credit to Charlie who called this trade and I reminded him of it. Nigerian all share, <clears throat> down 12.04% year to date. Ghana Stock Exchange, down 11.07% year to date. Namibia's economy has confronted four, has contracted for eight of the past nine quarters, agricultural and mining sectors struggling. Interesting report by Nielsen, Africa's prospects, macro business, consumer and retail indicators. Um, Kenya remains in top position, followed by Cote d'Ivoire and Tanzania, Ghana, Nigeria, fourth and fifth. Uganda slips to sixth place, South Africa. 7th, Cameroon in 8th. Uh, a lot of people would disagree with Kenya's position here. The market, the economy is far softer than Nielsen seemed to be indicating. Say, but they are saying consumer sentiment softer with only 41% of consumers feeling that their outlook for job prospects is good, excellent over the next 12 months. One third of Kenyans of the opinion that their personal finances are in a not so good, bad state, up 11 points. From a year ago, lots of interesting detail, I must say, in that report, and that's on rich wrap ups. If you are um, interested in taking a closer look at what uh, they are saying exactly, um, apparently Kenya is starting to tighten its belt after a 
get to binge criticism. The finance ministry said it will cut the government's spending for 2019-2020 fiscal year by 2.1%, equivalent to $445 million. Overall budget deficit target, however, remained unchanged at 5.9% of GDP. Nairobi all shares up 2.7% this year. The NSE 20 down 14.37% this year. I wish you a fabulous weekend. Thank you.